I'm very, very honored. And uh, why don't we pray, and then we'll see what the Lord will do. Exciting? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all our brothers and sisters here. I thank you that the church should look like this, where nations, where nations will gather, nations will hear your word, nations will bow their knees before you. And Father, I thank you at this time that, Lord, that you put me aside, that you speak through what you need to speak through to your church. Father, I pray that the words will be encouraging, the words will be edifying, but the words will be convicting as well. Because in the end of the day, Jesus, we want to honor you. In the end of the day, God, we want to, we want to show up before your presence and hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. And turn to joy my salvation. And Lord, I thank you so much for every single one of you here that, Lord, whatever situation that we're in, that God, there is always hope. There is always a solution through, you, through your son, Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Just a little bit of a background. I, I, yeah, so I, I was born in Malaysia. Uh, grew up in a very small town in East Malaysia called Sandakan, Sabah. I don't know if some of you might know that, but yeah, a small town. And then my family migrated to New Zealand when I was about 10 years old. And so I've, I've, been in, I've been in New Zealand for almost 20 years. And then the last three years, the Lord moved me to Singapore. My, 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 my work experience, my background, uh, it's primarily with youth social work. So I spent the last eight, nine years working as a youth social worker. I, I deal with youth at risk kids. Uh, when the law started me, I, I was working with very young age, between the, se between the age of seven to 12 years old. These are children that's been removed from mainstream school and they've been put in a special school where we deal with their behavior. And uh, you know, similar background, I, I, I went through a tough stage in my teenage year where I almost contemplated suicide uh, at the age of 17. You know, I did a lot of, uh, nasty stuff, got involved in, in gang fights, I, I, you know, I, I was involved with just very, very, you know, you talk about the prodigal son, I kind of lived that lifestyle for a bit. And then, you know, before I almost ended my life, the Lord literally rescued me uh, at a night at a friend's house where I almost jumped off the cliff. You know, at the age of 17, you know, you're just thinking, man, what's there to life? And, and, and I, almost, I almost gave it up and the Lord spoke very audibly to me and says, Calvin, I'm not finished with you, I'm not done with you, I have a purpose for you. And so at the age of 17, I began to, to, to ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do in my life? And it was in university that I literally got born again where a, a man from the States came and preached the gospel to me and really told me the true essence of what, who Christ is. It's amazing, I've, I've, been, I've grown up in church, but not, having, not knowing the gospel here. I mean, not knowing the gospel here, but having it here. A lot of people are going to church thinking that just because they go to church, they are safe, which is not true. Because going to church doesn't make you a Christian as much as going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger, <laughs> right? And so I, I live with that mindset thinking that, yes, until this man began to preach the gospel to me and share with me about the Lord and who he is, and it changed my life completely at the age of 17. And since then, I've been walking with the Lord, being disciple over the years, and then the Lord put me on a journey of walking with him, but not only that, seeing things differently. You know, growing, growing, in a, growing especially in an Asian family, you know, success and reputation is very, very important. The success of life. I'm sure living in Hong Kong here, as I live in Singapore as well, the pressure of life that the world system wants you to portray is to do well. Is to, I mean, it's nothing wrong with, with, with being excellent. It's nothing wrong with being successful. But being successful for different purposes or different reasons can sometimes get you in trouble. can sometimes get you in the wrong places because what if you don't attain all this doesn't mean that you are least in this world. And Jesus says that the least of the kingdom of this are the greatest. Jesus says that if you serve, you are the greatest amount. And so for me, you know, just growing up and then knowing that the Lord has put me in a path where I work with youth for eight years. So I work with juvenile youth. And then the Lord opened the door for me to be in Singapore where I work with the youth prison. I became a life coach in Singapore. So I deal with over 68 youth uh, who are fresh case, you know, who've done crimes. And the Lord put me in their path. And I'm always at court always at a court, sitting next to, next behind the judge, right there in front, and I'm standing right here, and the judge will always judge the boy and say, what have you done with your life? That you've given one year probation, what have you done with your life? It's amazing the boy will come into a, 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 a system where they say, sir, I want to, they call me sir because I'm their life coach. I'm the one that is like representing like a lawyer. Sir, I want to do well. I want to do well. But then they start off well, but then they don't finish well. Along the way, they, 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 they get into wrong mischief things. They, they break the law 
and then they go back into the court system and the judge says, I've given you one year, in three months' time you broke the law. What have you done with your life? And the boy will cry, will cry and say, Sir, coach, I mean, you know, judge, give me a chance, give me a chance. The judge says, I have given you a chance. I've given you a life coach. I've given you a sir that will walk with you for one year and you never wanted to change. And so they get sent into another prison, which is the adult prison later on, which they can't, they're locked there for three years. And so I deal with that. So I knew what it was like to, to walk among dysfunctional people. In fact, all of us are dysfunctional in many ways. We're not perfect. In fact, the church is not perfect. But the church is where God comes to and He revives, He brings restoration. And so I know what it's like to walk in brokenness. I know what it's like to walk in rejection. I know what it's like to know that I, you know, to, to feel lonely, to feel man, is, is there purpose in life? And so I want to really tap on, on, onto something that I call purpose. Because all of us, God has created you and made you for a purpose. You're not here just by a lucky mud. You're not here just to occupy space. You're not here just to breathe air and take out someone's oxygen. You are here for a purpose. And God created you to solve a problem. Yeah, you're very uniquely designed. It's amazing. I want you to take up your thumb and look at your thumb. Whether it's your left hand or right hand, look at your thumb. Look at your thumb print. It's amazing. There are over probably ab about 6 billion people on this earth here. And it's amazing that all of us are genetically, well, you know, DNA-wise, we all have very individual thumbprint. Yes. There's no duplicate here. God is not a duplicator. He is a creator. He creates things brand new all the time. And so that if you think that you are least significant, you're not important, you're wrong. God has created you individually, designing you very specific. It's you. There's no other like you. Even if you're a twin, your handprint is very, very different. I love traveling the airport because every time I have to go in there, I have to say, okay, you check your thumbprint scan. And I'm, man, God, I'm so fearfully and wonderfully created. <laughs> so every time I want you, when you go to the airport, you, you, when you get stamped or you look at your passport, look at your thumbprint, you are specifically designed here on this earth for a purpose. You're not a mistake. You're not just lucky mud. You're not here just to occupy space. So I want to encourage you with that. But I want you to turn to Genesis. If you have Genesis. <coughs> I'm going to cover this box because it's tempting to take some money out. <laughs> Just playing. <laughs> Who knows? The lot might multiply afterwards. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3. I want to take you on a journey about, about us being created, but more than that, how along the way things got wrong and how God redeemed us. In Genesis, you know about <coughs> Adam and Eve, right? How many of you know Adam and Eve? <laughs> Very good. They are the the originals that came out first that the Lord created. And you know that God, He made everything good. Everybody say good. good. Everything God created is good. In you, anything around you, God created is good. Nothing that God made was bad. Everything God made is good. So I want you to remember that, that there is goodness that God has put in all of us. That He's made us good. And it says here that in verse 3, chapter 3, sorry, and I'll just paraphrase it as I go because of time's sake. Of course, God created everything and God made Adam. You know, Adam was made from dust and he breathed life into Adam. Life into him. God, the only creation that God ever breathed life to, it was man. Everything he spoke, but it was Adam that he breathed life into it. That's why we are alive today. That's why we are living through the Spirit of God because that God breathed life into us. And so it says after that, that when God created Adam, he made Eve out of Adam's ribs. That's why there's a missing rib there. You know, I, I can go on further there about that. So Eve is not made out of dust, but it's made out of Adam's ribs. So that you are, you are very, very special, ladies. You are very, very special and uniquely made. And so, of course, when, when that happened, God spoke to Adam and says, you know what now? You know, take dominion of everything. Name every animal. So it's amazing. Before God gave Adam and a, a wife, he gave him a job. <laughs> he gave him a job to declare, to define, to bring 
to bring definition. You know, so he named all the animals and so forth, and after that, he gave him, Adam, uh, gave him Eve. But, you know, in the same time, God gave Adam and Eve a very, very clear instruction. That was that you can eat of any fruit of this tree, but there's one particular tree that you cannot eat. Correct? Yes. Okay, you know, help me in my Bible, because all of you here are Bible scholars, eh? So you can have, wow, even that came out straight away. Awesome, excellent job. And so, but there was one particular tree that Adam and Eve you know, that God commanded them not to eat. But then after that, you know, that's when the serpent came, correct? The serpent came and tempted. The serpent is Lucifer, which is the fallen angel. Okay, he was, he was crawling around in, in, on the earth, on, on God of Eden. And then basically, the serpent tempted Eve. And then that's when Eve took the fruit. I don't know whether it's an apple or it's an orange, but it's a fruit. It's a nice, very juicy fruit. It's very tempting. And so she ate of it, and then not only that, she gave it to Adam, and Adam, who was with her, and he took of it. Now, there's a lot of arguments, you know, especially when the lady says, yeah, amen, uh, you know, he should have told me that he shouldn't eat a fruit, okay? There's all this different theory about husband and wife. I, I've been through that before. A lot, of, a lot of talk about that, okay? We won't go into that. But the fact that it's both of them ate of it, okay? They, their eyes were open, they fall short. Their eyes was open and they sinned against God. It's not that the fruit that they ate made them sin. It is actually disobedience. Yes. It's disobedience. God instruct them that not to eat. But they disobey God. Because in nature, men always, men and women always are curious about more. Is there, is there anything that I'm missing out on that God's not showing me? And because out of, out of that curiosity, they began, they took the fruit out of disobedience. And so I love this, I mean, not love this part, but this part really convicted me because here it is in verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And it says here that he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. Because I was naked, so I hid. It's amazing that if you, if you, if you read in the, in the earlier part of it, they never realized they were naked. They never realized they were, they were afraid. Because when God breathes life into you, when God lives around you, He doesn't bring fear into you. He brings faith. He encourages you to walk by faith. But here it is, because they've allowed sinful things into their life, fear came on them and they realized they were naked. Okay, another word for naked is being exposed. See, the enemy uses that to scare us, to bring fear into us. That's why, and it says here that, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? Then the man said, okay, he talked about that. Woman, you know, you give the woman blaming, blame shifting. And what is this you have done? The woman say, okay, the woman blame shift the serpent as well. So everything else, and this is where tragedy began to happen. This is where sin began to grow. So knowing that God made the whole entire universe and earth and mankind, those two of them, perfect. It was good. But because of the rebellious and the sinful nature that Adam and Eve allowed to happen, it has taken its toll to this generation today, up to now. Up to now. Are we, are we clear that so far? Yeah. So realize that there are two things that the Lord keep on continuing asking us today. Is where are you? And who told you so? Many times in our life, when things are going well, we forget the Lord. I, I, I'm a culprit. I, 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 I'm a preacher and I'll tell you right now. I, I, I get into that. When things are going well, yeah, we tend to forget about the Lord. But when things are going tough, wow, we are praying on our knees, you know, we are throwing water, we are halala, you know, God, we are, you know, we start singing hymns or oh, worship your Lord, you know. Many times God asks us, where are you today? Where are you with me? And sometimes when we don't trust in the Lord enough in our own strength, we tend to have plan B or plan C or plan D. I mean, if you're a planner, you have many plans. But God only has one plan. But a lot of us, you know, we go through that. Oh, God, are you, are you you're with me, God? If not, okay, God, I'm going to plan my other ways. But God, if you're there, God, you can help me out. And God says, where are you? And who told you so? Who told you that you can't make it? 
Who told you that, that you are failure? Who told you that, that you are poor? Who told you that? And yet the enemy lies to them. And they believe in a lie, therefore they hid away from God and they sow fig leaves. There are a lot of people today who sow fig leaves to cover up their shame and their guilt. So that when they come to a church, when they come to their meetings, they look very good, very sharp. Like most of you look very good, very sharp this morning. But internally, we're struggling. We're struggling with our finances. We're struggling with our thought life. We're struggling in relationship. And we never really open up and expose ourselves. Say, say, God, I am naked. I need help. But we cover up when somebody prophetic say, hey, I sense there's something going on in your life. Oh no, brother, brother, sister, I'm, I'm doing fine. God is amazing. God, I mean, we always hear this script. We always have to say, oh, God is good. All the time. God is good. Yeah, but then we struggle internally. God is asking, where are you? And who told you so? So many of us believe in the lies of the enemies. So many of us turn on the news and we believe what the news says. You know, the only good thing about news is when the news reporter says is, good evening, blah, blah, blah. And then all the bad news. And then when he finishes off, good evening again. I mean, if you look at news today, there's nothing that's good. It's always bad report. I was at the Emirati uh, Causeway two days ago. You know, I, I found out about the, the, students. the students' protest. And I was walking there and I was praying and I was asking the Lord, why is, why is this happening? And I met this medical student who was there and I asked him, what are you doing here? He says, I'm protesting. Okay, I'm so what are you protesting about? I'm fighting for this nation here because I, I want to stand for something. And I think that's great. So I told him that I, I'm, 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 a, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm an evangelist. He says, oh, I'm a Christian too. And, and I say, oh, great. So I share with him my testimony and I pray for him. And, and, and I looked at him, I say, you know what? It's good that you're standing for something. Because it is better for you to stand for something than for someone who doesn't stand for anything and they will fall for everything. And so... This is what took place with Adam and Eve. They fall short, they covered themselves with leaves. And they went on doing that. And this has been passed on generation. You know what, today, God is still seeking. Man is still hiding and is still covering, but God is still seeking. He's seeking for his sons and daughters that will come out, out of the closet, come out, out of the hiding place and say, here I am, God. You know what, I don't have it all together. You know what, I, I expect people when they come to church, they shouldn't have it all together. I say it in a, in a real way, because church is a place where, you know, we don't have it all together, but we know one person have it all together, yes. and that's Him, Jesus. That's why we can come with a broken heart, broken place, and say, God, use me, heal me. The Bible throughout the history, He uses men and women who are inadequate. Yeah. I mean, you look at guys like David. I love David. I mean... The prophet Samuel came in and says, I'm going to anoint a king in your family line because Saul has fallen. You know, he disobeyed God. That's another scripture, another sermon in itself. And then God said, okay, I mean, and then God spoke to Samuel, anoint a king in this family. And then, of course, Jesse said, oh, these are all my sons. I mean, he put all the, the most macho looking GQ material, you know, to 500, you know, material right up in there. And, 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 and Jesse saying, no, I mean, and Samuel saying, no, there's something missing here. Do you have another son? You know, Jesse reluctantly say, oh yeah, I have one peep squid, you know, you know, you know, pimple face kid, you know, at the back there. He's looking after the sheep, you know, not very important. Do you really want him? And, and Samuel say, yes, bring him. And straight away the Lord anointed. Why did the Lord pick David among the ten other brothers? Or how many brothers there is? I don't know. God likes to use people who think they don't have it all together and he makes that something out of them. And you know, when the sin came into being, into the earth, we were all caught in bondage. And so, Moses came in, the, poor, the, it's the law of condemnation is what it's called. He bring in the law, the law of the Ten Commandments. How many of you know the Ten Commandments? 
Is everyone here Christian? <laughs> Do you read your Bible? Oh man, I'm going to convict you today. <laughs> no, just kidding. How many of you know the Ten Commandments? Did you know there's ten, right? Yeah. There's only, there's ten, but then the Torah has many commandments. But the Lord gave ten. The Ten Commandments that every man should live by. But the problem is that all of us have broken all the Ten Commandments. How many of you believe that? Yes. You don't believe that? Yes. All right. How many of you know the Ten Commandments? What's the first one? Thou shalt not have no other God before me. What's the second one? Wow. Okay, everybody, look at Exodus. We are doing Bible study here. That's why I'm a lecturer. Exodus 20. This is good. Read for you. What I'm teaching you here is so that you can understand the law because we are all under the law. Nobody here is above the law. But then there is something that you can go above the law and that is the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says the fruit of spirit, you have no boundaries. In fact, you can increase in more in, in, in all of that. But there is law that suppresses us and holds us down that we are guilty of. In Exodus 20, look at here. And it says here, let me read it out. Number one, I am the, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall not have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol in the form of any things in heaven above or on the earth beneath. It talks about that. Number three, it says that third one, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God for anyone who used the Lord's name in vain is guiltless who is misused his name, okay? It's amazing that I used to cuss a lot. I used to swear a lot. But it's amazing all, my, all the time of my teenage that I was not walking right the Lord, I always used his name in vain. You know, and not, if, not once, I remember I was playing, I love, how many of you love basketball here? I love basketball. I play, ba I love sports. And so, you know, I was playing basketball and one day, and I mean, this guy came out, I don't know, you know, we, we were playing and then somebody actually injured his feet and he screamed out, oh, Jesus, 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 oh, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. I went up to him and said, hey, man, you know Jesus? He said, oh, no, 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 I don't know Jesus. I don't know Jesus. I'm just, I'm just using his name in vain. Then I looked at him and I said, why would you use Jesus' name in vain? Why would you, I mean, have you ever seen someone hit their leg? Oh, Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. Oh, oh, my, my, my. You know, they always use Jesus' name in vain. Why? Because the name of Jesus has power. The same name of Jesus that we pray in Jesus' name, I pray for healing, brings out power. The enemy knows the power of the name of Jesus. That's why he wants to dilute it. He wants to level it, lower it down. And the Bible says here, do not misuse my name. That my name has power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that Jesus that lives within us. And it says here, what, what's next? Remember the Sabbath day, keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your works. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> I'm speaking to people in Hong Kong and Singapore and Asia. Is Jesus your Lord or has work become the Lord of your life? that you don't dedicate a day for the Lord and just rest. I mean, rest, really rest as in, you know what, turn off your email, turn off your phone and just rest in the Lord. Spend time honoring the Lord with your family, giving thanks to the Lord. Some of us are very good to, um, yeah, what's, the, what's the latest information? What's the latest news? What's the latest, what's, 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 you know, you become so workaholic that it is an addiction. And as, what's the next one? Fifth one, honor your father and your mother that you may live long in the land that your Lord God is giving you. How many of us want to live long? Okay, how many of you want to die tomorrow? No one, right? Come on. We all want to live. I mean, come on, right? Because we want to live as, that's why they, they, are, they are giving out new, new nutrition products, you know, facelift, all this different, you know. I mean, I was in Singapore, I mean, I was in South Korea. I love South Korea, it's amazing, but I, I can't believe the, the, the streets that I walk in, every single store is cosmetic makeup, cosmetic store, cosmetic store, <laughs> cosmetic store. It's the number one industry there. It's plastic surgery because there's something about people that don't want to die. They want to live long. And it says here that if you honor your father and your mother, that your life may be prolonged. It's a secret there. It's a principle. And there's a difference between honoring and, being, and, and obedience. 
Honoring is something that you honor them for who they are, for what they have done in your life. You honor them, even though they might have disagreement with you, but you honor them. And it says what? You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. I mean, it goes on. Four of the, four of the Ten Commandments focuses on your relationship with God. The last six of the commandments focus on your relationship with others. That's why it's so easy for us, God, to come to you, God, I love you very much. And God says that what? Love others as you have loved yourself. Love thy neighbors. It's tough. A lot, a lot of the commandments is deal with the relationship between you and others. But you know what? If you've broken one of these commandments, you've broken all of them. You're guilty of all. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Put up your hand. Come on, we're in church now. <laughs> oh, Pastor Rio, oh, thank you so much. I'm with you. I've told a lie. I've told many lies. How many lies do you have to tell to become a liar? <laughs> oh, Calvin, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, <clears throat> I'm a very reverend guy. You know, I don't, I mean, how many times you have to tell? Just once. How many of you have stolen before in your life? Let's be honest. I don't care whether it's five cents or five dollars or five hundred. I don't care if taking a box that doesn't belong to you. Oh, look at that. Wow, lovely flowers. Nobody wants it, right? Oh, I'll take it home. How many? How many times do you have to steal to become a thief? <laughs> Just once. Even an idea that does not belong to you, you stole it and you use it on your own. It's called stealing. It's thief. The Bible says very clearly as well that, oh, this is going to be tough. The Bible says that, that thou shalt not commit adultery. But Jesus made it even more. He fulfilled the law. Jesus did not make the law easier. He make, fulfilled the law by making it harder. He says, if you looked at a woman or a man and lust after him in your heart, you have already committed adultery with him or her physically. So it's, it's not about the outward experience, it's the heart. I won't even ask who, how many of you have, I mean, if, 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 our t if our forehead is a TV screen right now, how many of you will be wearing nice cowboy hats just to cover it? You see, all of us here have broken the Ten Commandments. So all of us are guilty. You know, God did not come to save a perfect world. He came for an orphan generation. He came for an orphan world. A world that is desolated, a world that is tormented, a world that is disregarded. That all of us, if we were to stand before God, we'll be guilty. We'll be guilty. And that's why if you look at the history of what Adam and Eve, the beginning of the part that God, He created everything that was good, but it was through Adam's and Eve's sin that brought into us and we are no different. We've fallen through that. And I have a lot of people that tell me, well, Kelvin, if I do a lot of good works, I can get into heaven. I can get into heaven. If I do a lot of good works, Kelvin, it means if I go to church, if I, if I pay my tithes and offering, Kelvin, if I, you know, if, I, if I help the old lady cross the road. I mean, always people use this example. I help the old lady cross the road. Or, you know, God, if I, if, Kelvin, if I do a lot of charity work, I'll go to heaven. And I always give them this illustration to tell them that, you know, sometimes we, we measure God to our standard. Hello? We measure God to our standard like, okay, God has to fit into our lifestyle. If God doesn't fit into our lifestyle, then we change Him. we just broken the same commandments. Thou shalt not make, create an image of false idol. You know, you can worship idol. It doesn't have to be an altar. You can worship idol in the things that you love. But the Bible says that where your treasure is is where your heart is at. You know, I've hang out with friends who love cars. They, every day they talk about cars, 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 cars. They modify their cars. They do, they, or somebody who loves their job, I mean, not just passionate, but really, you know, addicted to it. They always, you know, oh, I got to work, I got to work, I got to, you know. And so they worship their work. Promotion is their life. And so... A lot of people say, but if I do a lot of good works, Calvin, I can go to heaven. That's, a wrong, that's, that's wrong theology, it's wrong thinking. You see, any little bit of sin cannot get us into heaven. Because number one, God is holy, He is pure, He is righteous. 
He's unable to lie. This is nature, his attribute, who he is. And yet we try to lower God's standard so that he can match our lifestyle. But let me tell you something. Let me give you an illustration. This is um, a cold water. I got it from here in Hong Kong. It's probably quite pure because uh, it says 100% pure. So I'm not sure which mountain is it from. But let's just say that I come up to Pastor Reen and Pastor Reen, you're thirsty, right? <laughs> and I say, Pastor Reen, this is 100% pure water. Pastor Reen, would you drink it? Okay, not trying to drink it, but just, <laughs> would you drink it? Is it full or is it like this? It should be full, but you know, I just, I was if thirsty. It is full, I would drink it. You would drink it. <laughs> great, great. I mean, we are here, I mean, we're buddies, we're friends, right? But what if I say, okay, Pastor Reen, hang on a sec. I go to the toilet and I take one tiny drip of toilet water. Hey, Pastor Reen, how are you doing? Fresh water. Would you like to drink it? But do I know what you did? Yes, you saw me. All of you are looking at me. I'm doing it. No, I don't. Why won't you drink it? Why? Because it's been polluted. But it's only one tiny drip. You know what I'll do, Pastor Reen? I'll flush the toilet for you. So it's more clean, right? And I put a tiny drip, I'll, put, I'll give it back to you. Will you drink it? If I'm really, really, really desperate for it. <laughs> <laughs> I love your pastor. <laughs> he won't drink it. Why? Because even if it's a tiny drip of toilet water, to him, it's disgusting. To him, it's filthy. To him, it's unclean. And yet, all of us, we will fight against God and say, God, but I, I, I deserve this. God, I, God, I'm entitled to this. I mean, you've heard this term, entitled to deserve this. And yet, we look at our life, and God's standard is so high, and yet one tiny drip of sin fullness in our life and we say God we deserve heaven God says are you kidding me you see if by human nature we measure a tiny drip of toilet water has been disgusting and polluted how much more is God's standard and his nature is holy is righteous my friends and my mother and sisters we need to think about the importance of who God is and his nature see all of us have fallen short we can't go to heaven without that and yes, we know that by good works, you can get you so much, but you know what? It cannot get you there. And so, I want you to turn to Matthew 7. I'm going to land this plane here. This is the scripture that really convicted me. Matthew 7. Okay, I need to land the plane. Is it 11 o'clock, Pastor? Okay. I'm following the time right there. Matthew 7, let's finish it up here. It says here, not everyone, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Or some, another translation, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus was not talking to unbelievers. Jesus was talking to Christians, to believers. You know, in the olden days, I don't know about you, but I love watching uh, war movies. I love watching, the, you know, like the, the old night movie, like Braveheart, or, or, or you know, just like, like, you know, like really old English Saxon kind of movie. I remember watching, you know, one of those war. You notice the knight. They are the they are the guardians of the kingdom. They wear their amazing armor. I mean, it's like tons. It's, it, it weighs very heavy, probably about 30, 40 kilos. That chain that put in them, and they will fight. And they have a massive sword. And if you notice, if you watch a movie like Braveheart or, or some other old English, you know, war movie, the knight will always, you know, they are the heroes. They will, they will fight, they will conquer wars. But the moment they show up in the kingdom, in front of the king, they'll walk in there with their sword, you know, looking mildly like they've won a war. But then they will come before the king and they will kneel down with their sword. You know what they'll say? My lord. What would you have me do? My Lord, this is my message for you. My Lord, this is the report that I've given to you. We have conquered such, such and such places. Even a knight who is the most powerful in his craft skills will acknowledge that the king is the ultimate ruler of all. 
the knight will have to submit and surrender and say, it's my Lord. And here it is, Jesus says that, why do you call me, in that day, in Luke 6, 46, says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? And it says here, in the same terminology, Lord, the word Lord means boss, means master, means He is supreme of everything over your life, over your thought life, over your finances, over your family, over your friendship, even over your career. And it says here, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will end in the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, when Jesus repeats something twice, it's probably very, very important. When you read the word, therefore, therefore, something is going to happen. When you read the word, Lord, Lord, Jesus is emphasizing. I know there are times where, you know, maybe during, I'm young, during when I was young in time, my mom, you know, asked me to do something and I'm, I'm, you know, I can hear her, but I'm playing my games or I'm doing something. And then, when, you know, when she called me again, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pretend I can hear, but I'm doing my thing. Until my mom called me twice, Calvin, Calvin, gets my attention. I say, yes, mom. When, when Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, He's making a very clear statement. Hey guys, don't get mixed up with where you're at and who you are and what you're doing. If you're really calling me Lord, Lord, is your life resemblant to what I've called you to be? Are you living the life that I'm called call you to be? And he says here that many will say to me on that day, what is that day? I don't know. I hope it's not the day that you meet your Jesus in heaven or that day you experience turmoil. But it says here, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? This is amazing thing. Some of, how many of you have raised someone from the day before? I want to. I've, I've, prayed for, I've prayed for people that receive healing. I've seen it grows, grows before me. These are amazing miracles that people are experiencing. But yet Jesus says that, what well, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. The word knew you, which means genosko. In the Greek word, it means intimacy. I had a prayer. If I had a privilege, I love basketball. Let's say, let's, let's say for example, that I was given two... T- How many of you love basketball here? I just want to make sure I'm talking to the right crowd. Okay, <laughs> football. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> What's your favorite team? Uh, oh. Chelsea. Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's the number one, number one football player in Chelsea? Oh, I'm really testing you there. Right? Yeah. Who? You like all of them? How many of you like David Beckham? No. Oh, no. I'm speaking to the wrong crowd. Okay, how many of you know Michael Jordan? Yeah. yeah. Brother, what's your name? Philip. Philip. Let's say that Philip and I were given two tickets to Chicago Bulls in Chicago. Everybody, wow. We were given free ticket there to attend their basketball game. We're going back to the future. I mean, we're going back, way back. Not the future, but back in the past. And we're invited, and we, 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 we love Michael Jordan. We have his gears. You have Jordan's. My one is Jordan Levens. I have all his gears, MJ, you know, Nike clothes. And we're in front of the crowds. And we see Michael Jordan training with Scottie Pippen and all the other basketball players. And we are screaming his name, Michael! Okay, I would be Michael. He'll be Michael! Okay, high, high voice. And then, how many of you think that Michael Jordan would stop his practice and come up to me and Philip and say, hey, what's up? How are you going? Shake your hands. Hey, man, good to see you. How many of you think that we would do that? No. Wow, you guys don't have faith in us, eh? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm good looking. I, uh, he's good looking too, you know. You know, why not? We are wearing Michael Jordan's clothes. We are wearing Michael Jordan gears. He might be wearing Michael Jordan's cologne. You know, he, you know we, we shoot like him. You know, we, we put his tongue out, you know, when he dunks. We, we do exactly what Michael Jordan does in his move. And yet you guys say, no. That's very surprising. Why? You don't know him. Hello? When was the last time me and Philip have dinner with Michael Jordan? When was the last time we went and hang out at his mansion and play, play sports with him? Or advise him, you know, or, or dine with him? Never. Never. We just wear his gears. We look like him, we talk like him, but we never have intimacy with him. Friendship, relationship. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Away from me, I, for I never knew you. That means you only know him here, but here there's never a transformation. 
That's why Jesus says, why, you know, why would you call me Lord, Lord, and only do what I say in Luke 6, 46? My brothers and sisters, that's why this is a very, very sobering, challenging message for all of us here. I come back to, back to Genesis and say, God is asking us, who are you, where are you, and who told you so? If today you call Jesus as your Lord and Savior, is He Lord and your Savior because good things are happening in your life? Or is He Lord of your life and Lord and your Savior in your life when good or bad things are not going well, you still call Him Lord and you still worship Him? Because that's the challenge for today. Because all of us, one day, we will stand before God and God's going to ask us, what have you done with your life? And you say, oh Jesus, I, I love you. I, I, oh God, I love you. I worship you. And it's great on a Sunday service, but when you go out to the four corners of this world, of this world are you the same person as you are that God says that sees you? He's challenging us all today. And Jesus says here, you know what? If I'm Lord of your life, there needs to be a change. There needs to be a revelation that takes place, a, a change from the inside out. That's why it's called salvation. A lot of people think that we can have God as our sight. You know, as, it's, as if it's your fire insurance. You know what fire insurance is? When every time there's a fire, man, I get an insurance, I get claimed back. We treat God as like our, our genie in a bottle. Rub three times. God, what can you do for me? What can you do? God, I want to be rich. What can you do for me, God? He's not Lord. He's your puppet. Today, my challenge for us is, is Jesus Lord of your life? Babe, can you come play? You know, if you're constantly worrying, if you're constantly worrying and concerned about things in your life, it means that Jesus is not Lord of your life in that area. Worry and concern is Lord of your life. The Bible says clearly that He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in prayer and supplication, offer your thanksgiving with request to the Lord. I would like us to bow our heads right now. I'm going to pray. The reason why I share about Adam and Eve sin and salvation because I want to paint you a picture that that is very true that God made everything good He made everything perfect but in the midst of sin we allowed things to creep into our life to mess things up and humankind human being is always on a journey of trying to patch things up you know oh, oh I, I've got a naked area here so you know what I'm going to cover it with a leaf Oh, oh, you know, oh, oh, you know, my finances are in turmoil. Oh, oh, so you know what? I'll take a, I'll, 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 I'll find a way to cover it. And we hide behind fig leaves, thinking that it's okay. God will understand. God understands it, but many times it's not. God needs to know it, but we need to know it and need to recognize that. You know what? I don't have it all together, but Jesus does. And I can't stop playing games, which means that I can't just show up on Sunday and say, oh, everything is fine. And then Monday to Saturday, I'm living like hell. Literally living like hell. It means that things are going so bad that you're not willing to open up, not willing to ask for help. Relying on your own strength. That's why, that's why Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, trust in the Lord and lean on your own understanding. Because our understanding is carnal, it's fertile. Trust in the Lord, lean on in our standing. In all we do, in all our ways, we need to acknowledge Him. Acknowledge means surrendering, which means submitting to Him. Today, there's a lot of people in this room, I sense that you have not surrendered things in your life to Jesus. You have hold on to it. You have hold on to it like, like a kid who put his fist into a cookie jar and couldn't get his hand out of the cookie jar because he's so concerned about the cookie, but his hand is stuck in the cookie jar. And all it is he had to do is let go of the cookie jar so that his hand can be released out. But so many of us here are holding on to things tightly and God says, I require that. I want that. 
I'm asking you to release it, but trust me. And he says, I'll make your path straight. There has been a lot of windy path in this here, in this room here. Some of you are even questioning about your purpose. The purpose of, man, what am I doing here in Hong Kong? Oh man, life is so tough. I feel lonely. I feel stretched. God, I know you love me. I know you, I know you have plans for me, but God, I'm doing my own thing. That, that has been independent. That is trusting on your own strength. And God's saying today, let go of the cookie jar. Let go of that cookie, that biscuit that you've been holding tightly. Release it so that you can be free from that jar and your hand can be free. There are many people here who are tightly bound with their hands. I sense that. I sense that anxiety and fear, stress. God did not give us stress. He gave us peace. God did not give us fear. He gave us faith. God did not give us turmoil, but He gave us compassion. Father, I'm praying for a release right now of Your presence. To touch lives right now, individually. Is He Lord of your life? I'm not asking if He's Lord of the salvation. Yes, you are saved by grace through faith. But I'm asking you, is He Lord of your life? In the areas that you are putting your hand in that jar, you're not letting go. He can be Lord of that. You can trust Him. And if that's you, I want to pray for you. If that's you, I want you with eyes closed right now. I want you to lift your hands up and say, Calvin, that's me. Pray for me. Yes. That you're struggling. And it's okay because we are weak, but He's strong. You know, when I understand humility, when I understand meekness, is when I don't have the right to control. I don't have the understanding, but I know He does. Humility is surrendering your will to understand and say, God, I trust you. Father, I pray for those who are hands have raised. I want you to, be clear, to begin to declare right now, in Jesus' name, I release it right now. Say in your own mouth. Say in your own mouth right now. Jesus, I release whatever that is. Say that. God, I release right now the ability to say that, man, I'm taking this relationship to my own. I release it right now. Some of you, I, I, I really sense that the Lord, that you are struggling with the area of relationship, <coughs> particularly with, with spouse. Particularly with getting to a wrong relationship, you know you shouldn't. You know, Adam and Eve shouldn't have gone next to the tree, but because they keep on fiddling around, touching the leaves, they were playing around with the tree, surely enough, they got, they got caught into eating that fruit. The Lord saying, today is a day that you should build boundaries around you. Biblical, holy boundaries to cover you, to protect you. Father, I pray for a release right now of peace. In Jesus' name, I release that right now. Holy Spirit, bring your restoration right now. Release that right now. We just wait. I pray against the spirit of fear. Some of you have not been sleeping well night after night because you've been tormented. You've been tormented. I don't know if, if there's someone that's, I, I, I'm just prophesying right now. If that's you, if you've been tormented, I mean, I mean tormented is like sleepless night, just worry and concern. I see a, a, a dark cloud over your head right now. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand up. If that's you, I'm gonna pray for you. Father, I release that right now. I release the spirit of peace over them right now, in Jesus' name. I release that right now, in Jesus' name. For healing, for healing of the mind, for healing the mind. I release that right now in Jesus' name. I release that right now in Jesus' name. Healing of the mind. Lord, that she will not be conformed to the longer, longer to the penance of this world, but be she be transformed at the reading of the mind in true Christ Jesus. Father, that she will take your word seriously. She will take the word of God and wash it over her, God. Some of you have 
really spoken words over your life, like really terrible words, even like vows, inner vows. Like you, some of you have made inner vows. I, when I think about inner vows, it's like I will never be like so and so. I will never do this. The word, you know, when you when you when you self prophesy of yourself, you bring about destruction. The Lord wants to break that today. If that's you, I want you to begin to, to lift your hands up. I want to pray for you. Like, it's just spoke, death words spoken over your life. You say, I'm not going to be like this. Yes, there's one here. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. I break that right now in Jesus' name. I release for wholesomeness. I release for healing right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, just, just bring your peace, God. Lord, you do business with your children here. I want to offer this opportunity, last one, is that if there's anyone here in, in this room that you have not made Jesus Lord of your life, then I'm, not, I'm not talking about whether you go to church or not, whether you, you know, it's that Jesus has never been Lord of your life. It means that you're not a believer. You, 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 you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as, as your Lord and Savior. Today you can because today is the day of salvation. And I pray that God will give you that. If that's you, I want to pray for you. That today is the day of salvation. You can give your heart to Jesus. If that's you, I want you to lift your hands up. So I can pray with you. It is probably the best decision that you ever made in your life. Because God is a sovereign God. He loves you. He cares for you. He sent His Son, Jesus, down the cross so that you can be free from guilt and condemnation. Father, I pray for those who are in the bring of decision that Lord you would help them find peace with you I pray that Lord you reveal your heart to them in a place where they can hear you Father that they will repent their, from their sins that they will turn away from their sins and turn to you that God that they will give their heart to you today Jesus I release that over them Father I pray even right now for healing over the bodies for those who are not well I pray in Jesus in that Lord you bring restoration you bring restoration to their health, God. Hallelujah. Let's stand, lift our hands to the Lord this morning and just thank Him. We often ask things and expect things from the Lord, but just let's close this meeting just with saying thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. From the bottom of my heart, with everything within me, I just say thank you, Lord, for what you have done in my heart today, in my life, changing me, correcting me, convicting me. Thank you for being God, knowing me. And you love me so much that you want to change me so that we will be together for eternity. Thank you for what we've heard today. Thank you for the living word, the Holy Spirit. Thank you that this word is alive the holy spirit is alive and our relationship to you must go on of being alive lord. thank you lord to bless the church oh god and the decisions we've made this morning the surrendering that we have done this morning that we we will put steps into it this this week we will continue to walk in it we will make concrete things not only mental decisions because we are touched Sunday morning, but on Monday, Tuesday, we will live it out. We will practice. We will practice walking free. Walking in this new freedom. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and everyone says, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.